sound all right? Yes. Um, so some of the other talks, including the one we just heard and uh, the talk from uh, Margaret yesterday is a great lead into the, the kinds of things that I'll talk about now. My lab um, uh, is particularly interested in how the mechanical and chemical environment surrounding cells affects their behavior. And today I'm going to talk specifically about the work we've been doing looking at how cells form networks um, and uh, form tissue-like structures based on the mechanical environment that, that, that they're residing in. So um, uh, as I just said, we're particularly interested in, in how cells interact with their extracellular matrix. There are about 10 to 13 cells in the body. I just recently found out about 60% of those are, are red blood cells, just a sort of fun fact. Um, and there's about 200 different cells, and each of those interacts with their extracellular matrix in a very specific way to form tissues. And those tissues, of course, um, come together to form organs. And my lab is very specifically interested in how cells interact with their extracellular matrix to assemble into tissues and what kind of cues we can give cells to allow them to self-assemble. Uh, a lot of the things that I'll talk about are broadly applicable to a number of different kinds of cell systems, but my lab in particular has been interested in the vascular system. Uh, the vascular system in the sort of crude, uh, crude cartoon ranges everything from large arteries down to the small capillary networks. Uh, in my own work, we focus at all of these scales, actually, but today I'll just focus on the work that we've been doing looking at this process of uh, capillary formation and, and very small vasculature on the order of microns um, in comparison to, to millimeters at the larger scales. So again, we're focused on the, the smaller scale of angiogenesis, the formation of capillaries, uh, which is, uh, by classical definition, angiogenesis is the formation of capillaries from pre-existing ones. It's this very complicated multi-step process. Uh, in this cartoon, it's initiated by the production of some angiogenic factor that's released into the surrounding extracellular matrix milieu that then binds endothelial cells, uh, activates them, causes them to proliferate and migrate out of their pre-existing blood vessel um, into the extracellular matrix, into the surrounding tissue. Uh, the endothelial cells then begin to remodel their matrix uh, they ultimately form tubes and loops, which allow, uh, then allow blood to flow, of course. And then these, these vessels are ultimately stabilized by the recruitment of parasites, which is difficult to see, but the parasites basically wrap around the capillaries and stabilize them uh, to support blood flow. And so, uh, again, as you can see, it's this multi-step process, and this is even um, simplified compared to what we do know about angiogenesis. And my lab is particularly interested in how cells migrate and remodel their extracellular matrix to form these structures and whether or not we can induce this in an in vitro environment. So we've been thinking about this problem for um, quite some time. From the time I was a graduate student at Penn working with Dan Hammer um, up until now when I, I, I'm working in my own lab. Uh, and we've tried to take this sort of an engineering approach to it and looking at, at each scale that allows cells to, to contact and form structures. So we started by first looking at how my cartoon cell here adheres to a matrix and the kinds of forces it exerts during that adhesion. Uh, then we then moved up and looked at how cells actually spread and assemble cytoskeleton and exert forces during that process to understand the mechanisms by which cells sense their environment, uh, even as they're assembling uh, cytoskeleton and focal adhesions. We then started to look at how the extracellular matrix environment that affects these, how the extracellular matrix environment affects the ability of cells to migrate. Um, in hopes of again of a, of a precursor to tissue assembly, which is now the stage we're at. So now we're trying to understand what drives cells to, uh, to actually contact and connect with each other to form stable structures. And so really, uh, in my talk today, I'm going to focus on these last two steps, how the extracellular matrix environment, both the, me the mechanics of the environment and the chemistry in the environment, affect the ability of these cells to migrate and ultimately form contacts uh, and to self-assemble into structures. So this is um, sort of old hat after the things we've been uh, hearing about uh, over the past few days. The idea that cells can respond to both mechanical forces and chemical forces uh, to change their phenotype. And so there's typically uh, believed that there's some mechanism by which cells sense these cues. They translate them into some chemical signal, some signal transduction pathway, that then interpret these cues into a change in cell phenotype. And the, the right-hand side here, these chemical cues are pretty well understood, um, pretty well studied. And then mechanical forces, uh, again, as we've been seeing over the past couple days, are really coming to light um, uh, uh, more often, uh, just recently. 
when people study the vasculature and they think about the mechanical forces, most people jump to fluid shear stress. And I won't actually talk about fluid shear stress today. That's not to say it's not important in the system that we're talking about. It's just not the mechanical force that we're most interested, interested in. Instead, I'm going to focus primarily on the, the mechanics of the matrix, uh, which seems to, to run in theme with a lot of the things that, that we've been thinking about. So my lab loves time-lapse microscopy, so I'm going to show you a lot of movies today, um, which hopefully should, should convey a lot of the message that I'm trying to get across. So these are endothelial cells, uh, bovine aortic endothelial cells, plated on just tissue culture styrene, polystyrene. And um, these are the kinds of things that I, <coughs> it's better than TV. So um, <laughs> we watch the cells migrate around. And this, again, uh, uh, you would see this in any common culture dish. This is what's happening when your cells are in the incubator. They move around uh, relatively randomly. Uh, these cells divide once, uh, once a day or so. Um, they move by the ruffling of their uh, leading edge. Um, and, and again, under no stimulus, the migration is somewhat random. And the important part here is that in culture, of course, they're not assembling in, into any sort of structure, except that they're attached to a dish, um, maintaining a well-spread morphology. And in fact, um, any amount of quantitative analysis on these dishes has led us to believe that as far as cell-cell contacts are concerned, they're not really affecting the cell behavior um, in, a, in a market way. Do they cluster if you do they, say that again? Do they form clusters? No, no, not these cells. So uh, that's the one caveat I'll say. So it's very different than um, epithelial cells. Uh, these cells do not form, uh, at least not in our hands, not ever form clusters. When they divide, um, uh, they might bump into each other. But if, if you analyze enough cells, we don't see any sort of directed cell-cell adhesion. Um, the migration is, is relatively random on, on very stiff surfaces. And that's where the story is going, um, how it changes when you change the mechanics of the environment. So uh, what we were actually intrigued by is a number of studies, um, largely started by uh, Judah Folkman, um, looking at how angiogenesis occurs in creating in vitro systems uh, to look at this. And essentially, if you can take endothelial cells in culture and place them on the correct extracellular matrix environment, they'll start to self-assemble. Uh, without any other external cues. So even independently of growth factors or cytokines or anything like this, um, the cells will start to self-assemble and form these network-like structures that, that branch out um, and even form lumens. And so what we were interested in understanding is what about this environment is inducing this behavior. So it was largely thought that it's the actual composition of the matrix that you're, that you're putting your cells on, whether it's a match or gel laminin, or whether it's a collagen or whether it's a fibronectin is going to induce these changes in endothelial cell assembly. And we actually speculated because of these gels being relatively soft that in part that it's not just the chemistry of the gel, but it's also the mechanics of the gel. And so I'm going to talk about that, um, uh, what led us to, to that thought and, and where we've gone with it since then. So a lot of our work is built off of this differential adhesion hypothesis, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, it was first postulated by Malcolm Steinberg in the 60s. And basically, he developed a hypothesis to describe how tissues form in early embryonic development. And the idea is basically that tissues form based on the strength of cell-cell adhesion. So when cells are more tightly bound to each other, they're more likely to stay bound to each other. And more weakly adherent cells will then surround those tissues. So it's a basically in minimizing the, the surface-free energy to maximize the um, cohesiveness of the structure. And he developed the theory basically by taking embryonic tissue and digesting it into the multicellular types and then allowing it to self-aggregate. And what he found is that cells that are most strongly adherent to each other tend to form this core of the re-aggregation. And cells that are less strongly adherent to each other tend to form around these structures. So again, the idea is Based that it, the, the idea is based right in the title that this differential adhesion that cells have for each other allows cells to form structures. And so we started thinking about this and thinking, well, if it's not only cell-cell contacts that can cause this behavior, but maybe it's also cell matrix contacts. So how strongly adherent a cell is to its matrix versus how, how strongly adherent a cell is to another cell that will prompt um, its, its self-assembly and sorting. And so we started off in a very simplistic way. Hopefully you guys can see this. It looks a little dark up there. Um, but we started off in a, a pretty simplistic way of basically watching cells migrate and trying to figure out 
what goes on when they come into contact with each other. And we saw three fundamentally different behaviors when we watched cells come into contact. The first is this first behavior. You can see the two cells right here. And basically, um, there's nothing really significant. This is the same sort of behavior you'd see on poly, um, polystyrene, nothing too special going on. The cells migrate. They do touch from time to time. Um, but there's no significant shape change, so the overall projected area doesn't change. Um, there's no significant cell-cell contact attachments that keep the cells bound together. The second behavior we saw was actually very, very different. Um, and we've termed it sort of this tug-of-war behavior. You'll see these two cells. What happens is the cells come into contact, and then they form basically a tether as they pull apart. And then one basically loses the tug-of-war and will actually get popped off the surface and sort of flung in the opposite direction. So if you watch, so they form this tether and then they sort of fly apart. Um, and then the third behavior is, is somewhat like this, except what happens in this behavior is that the cells are less adherent to their matrix. They come into contact, they again form this tether, and again the tug of war uh, ensues, and one cell gets pulled off the surface towards the other and, and, uh, and loses the tug of war. So you can see it a couple times. The cells will try and respread on the surface, they'll form this tether, and then one cell will get pulled off the surface. And so there's this constant tug of war between the, three, the cells. And these three behaviors we see pretty much um, exclusively. So when you watch cells come into contact, depending on the environment that you're giving the cells, one of these three behaviors occurs. And so we looked at these behaviors in the context of the, the kind and amount of ligand that we're giving the cells. So independent of mechanics yet, we're simply looking at how the uh, density of the extracellular matrix that the cells are given, how that affects the, the cell contact behavior. For these experiments, we're using a simple peptide, an RGD peptide, which um, binds integrin, but doesn't have all the complexities associated with fibronectin or collagen. It's just a simple integrin binding sequence. And what we found is, um, just to go over, this A behavior is where cells come into contact, but there's no real significant changes in the cell behavior. This B contact, where the cells come together, they form a tether, they have this sort of tug of war issue, and then one cell ends up getting snapped off the surface away from the adjacent cell. And then the C-type behavior where the cells come to contact, they form a tether, and then one cell gets um, pulled towards the other cell, losing the tug of war. And so what we found actually is that this behavior is highly dependent on the amount of, of protein, uh, the amount of adhesivity that you give the cell. So the more, um, uh, the more adhesive a surface is, the more likely it is to exert this A-type behavior, where the cells stay well spread and the cell-cell contacts have no real effect on the, the, the cell behavior. And the less adhesive the surface is, uh, the less adhesive the surface is, the more likely the cells are to come into contact and get pulled off the surface um, in this tug of war, where they basically are trying to make a decision between cell-cell contact and cell-substrate contact. And in this case where there's very little lichen, they almost always make this this, um, this decision to be connected to an adjacent cell rather than to the matrix. So we, we sprung from that and said, okay, so if we're making a surface less adhesive using um, chemistry, can we also do it during using mechanics? So it's sort of um, well established now that if a surface is more compliant, cells tend to spread less. Just like if you give them less ligand, they tend to spread less. And so we looked at the behavior of these cells on very compliant substrates to, to investigate how cell, cell contact varies based on the compliance of the substrate that you're giving the cells. And what we found is that on soft substrates, the cells tend to stay stuck together um, throughout the duration of the experiment. So this is a six-hour time course, but if you had watched these cells for 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours, assuming that they don't divide and assuming no other cells come in the field of view, these, these cells stay, stay stuck together. So Do they degrade? I'll show you data about that in a second, um, but they they do move some. Uh, so you can, if you even look here, you can see that this cell has changed shape substantially from zero hours to six hours. So they're they're moving somewhat, but if you look at the overall translocation, it's it's relatively minimal. Whether they're whether they're alone or whether they're with a the cell pair. Uh, let's skip down the stiff substrates. So there's no surprises here. If you give a substrate, if you give a cell a substrate that's really stiff, um, identical chemistry as the soft substrate, but just stiffer, the cells will bump into each other and then migrate on their uh, on their merry way. So it's almost as if the other cell wasn't even there. 
And the really interesting behavior actually was on these intermediate compliance substrates. What we found actually is that the cells will come into contact and then they'll separate and then they'll come into contact again. And this, um, this little time course I've shown you is six hours, but in fact, um, over the six hour time period, these cells have come into contact and separated over six times. So about once an hour, they'll touch each other and then move away from each other and then touch each other and move away from each other. And um, we've seen this behavior pretty consistently, and this will continue to happen, um, in our experience at least, this will continue to happen until, again, either the cell divides or another cell migrates into the field of view. So with no other um, external influences, these cells come together and separate, come together and separate, come together and separate. So this is a, a pretty interesting phenomena, um, in our opinion, uh, because it, it's not the same as clustering, right? So it's not as if the cells are just <coughs> proliferating and moving outward, but in fact that they're migrating away from each other and then in a very directed fashion migrating back. And so as promised, we looked at the migration of these cells. Um, here we've quantified the dispersion, which is basically a measure of the cell diffusivity, um, how likely a cell is to move away from its starting point over time. And let's focus first on the dark bars um, for single cells. Um, as we might expect, cells are able to migrate better on stiffer surfaces. Uh, and, and this has been shown by a number of groups, varies a little bit by cell type, but in general, cells are more migratory on stiffer surfaces. Now, if you look at the cell pairs, let's start with the stiff substrates. On really stiff substrates, the behavior of, cell, of cells interacting as pairs, the migratory behavior of cells interacting as pairs, is not statistically significant from the behavior of a single cell. So again, it's as if that second cell isn't there. Uh, let's go down to the really soft surfaces. Uh, again, the behavior isn't very significant, uh, is not significant, but then again, our cells aren't moving much at all on soft substrates to begin with. And then again, um, this is basically our way of quantifying the, the images I just showed you, which is that single cells migrate well, uh, fairly well on these intermediate compliant substrates, but when then they interact with cell pairs, they don't migrate very far from their starting point. So again, it's a, our way of quantifying the fact that when cells are interacting as pairs, they tend to stay in the same location, the same vicinity as their partner cell. So uh, we <coughs> continued to pursue this because it seemed uh, pretty intriguing to us what was keeping these cells together. And we actually quantified um, what we considered um, our, our region of influence. So how far away from the cell edge can a cell actually propagate forces and displacements that the second cell might actually do both sides? So the overriding question here is, is a cell exerting traction forces on its substrate that are actually inducing adjacent cells to come closer? And so we started off with a really sort of back of the envelope way of doing this. We looked at a cell and we looked at the displacements of uh, beneath the cell. Uh, the substrate is basically embedded with beads. I'll talk a bit, uh, more about this in a, a minute. But the substrate is embedded with beads, and then we just track the bead displacements, and we look to see how far from the cell edge these beads appreciably move. So of course this is limited um, by our imaging resolution, um, but it gave us sort of a, a again, a back in the envelope guess on how far the, the disturbances the cells are creating move away from the cell edge. And what we find, so let's start with these gray bars, what we find is that on soft substrates, the displacements are, are relatively far from the edge, and then decrease as you increase the stiffness of the gel, and that, that makes sense. Um, on really stiff surfaces, um, it's not even possible to see the substrate displacements because they're uh, so appreciably small, um, if existent at all. Um, and th we then looked at how far the cells actually separate from each other. So remember I said the cells touch and they come together, they touch and they come together, and we just measured the distance um, that they separate during this phenomenon. So how far can they possibly get from each other? And what we found actually is that the cell-cell separation distance over our time period, which is again six hours, is very large um, on stiff surfaces. And on soft surfaces, it's very small, so the cells aren't, aren't moving at all from each other. And then on these intermediate compliant substrates, the actual distance that the substrate displacements is very comparable, statistically uh, similar, to the distance which the cells separate. So this data indicates to us, at least, that the cells are pulling on the substrate and the cells never move further from each other than the distance of this pulling mechanism. So it led us to this question now, whether or not cells can actually mecha mechanically communicate through the substrate. So can one cell pull on the, the carpet and have another cell sort of get slid next, uh, uh, slid towards it? Can it sense the tension created from one cell to the next? 
And this actually wasn't a huge stretch. Um, a lot of the data connect, uh, um, collected by Yuli Wang um, and his group has indicated that cells can sense tension in the substrate. Uh, if one uses a microneedle and pulls on a substrate, um, cells tend to mo move towards the increasing tension in the substrate. However, it's never been shown on the scale at which cells exert forces. So can cells actually use this as a, as a mechanism to come together? And so um, to figure this out, uh, whether, or not we've, whether or not cells can actually sense each other, we used uh, traction force microscopy, um, uh, a version of which Margaret talked about yesterday. Uh, we used the elastic substratum method as well um, uh, in collaboration with Mike Dembo. And the, the general gist of it is that we take our deformable substrates that are made out of uh, polyacrylamide, we embed it with fluorescent markers, we watch the fluorescent markers move, and based on those movements, we back out the forces the cell exerted to create the substrate displacements. And again, my love of uh, time-lapse microscopy. So this is an endothelial cell migrating on a polyacrylamide gel embedded with bees. So you can see the bees somewhat in the background. This is the corresponding fluorescent image. And again, you can see the, boot, the bees underneath the cell uh, moving. So a little bit like footprints in the sand, so to speak. And we can track those speed displacements and then back out the forces the cell exerted to create those speed displacements. The reason we wanted to implement traction force microscopy in this case was to then understand whether or not cells could exert enough force that an adjacent cell might be able to respond to those forces. So this is just um, to get us all on the same page. We've heard a lot about contractility of, of cells. Endothelial cells, too, are very contractile. Um, this is an output of, of traction force microscopy. Basically, cells uh, tend to exert the largest forces at their cell edge, and all those forces tend to point inward. So the cell is, um, is very contractile. It's a little bit clearer here on the, the color contour plot where these warm colors indicate the magnitude of the traction that, again, is highest at the cell edge. And um, not just at the cell edge, but on the, the extensions of the cell. And so we wanted to use traction force microscopy to look at how cells change their traction forces as they're coming into contact and determine whether or not a substrate is there enough force that it can actually propagate through the substrate, the displacements can propagate through the substrate and then be felt by an adjacent cell. And so what we did was we looked at many, many cell pairs as they were coming into contact. Uh, this example uh, I'm showing because if, if you spend a lot of time looking at cell migration, um, you would guess that this cell is probably moving from left to right, and this cell is probably moving the opposite direction from right to left. And so we would expect, perhaps, that these cells might not actually come into contact at all if they were moving at about the same, same speed. And what, in fact, you see over time, and this takes about two hours or so, what happens is that the cell will actually start migrating towards an adjacent cell. And so if you look here in the first frame, you can see the cells sent out a very small pseudopodia towards the adjacent cell. What's interesting is by the second time point, this cell has started to um, extend uh, some of its membrane towards the adjacent cell as if it's going to now reach out and touch this cell. And by our final point, we do have cell-cell contact where both cells have reached out their arms to come into contact and touch. And so again, we chose these because the movement that we end up seeing is sort of counter to the movement that we would have expected to see. And so the question is, is the presence of an adjacent cell prompting these cells to come into contact? And so we use traction force microscopy to look at the forces um, that cells are exerting during this, this change. So let's talk about the most obvious thing. First of all, um, the cell, the, before they come into contact, the most significant forces are all localized to the cell edge, just as we've, we've always seen. And as the cells come into contact, actually, there's a really big drop off in the force um, at the, at, in the middle of the cell. So basically, once they've come into contact and formed a stable cell-cell contact, it looks to us, at least, like the contractile balance of the cell shifts all to the cell periphery um, uh, as the two cells now balance each other. But what we're actually really interested in, again, is whether or not one cell is exerting enough force for an adjacent cell to, to feel that force. And so we focus particularly on this pseudopod because this is the first guy to, to um, reach out and touch that one, so to speak. And this guy responds to those forces. So we're going to look at, at, at the force that this pseudopod exerts to determine whether or not those forces are substantial enough for this adjacent cell to feel those forces. And what we found actually is just using some basic elastic theory that the force of the pseudopod, again, um, uh, well, let me cut to the punchline, that the force that this pseudopod exerts is significant enough to be sensed by the adjacent cell. 
And the way we approximated this was, again, to calculate the force the pseudopod was exerting using traction force microscopy. And we looked at, um, basically, the distance between the two cells. And then we, we modeled this cell and its ability to sense an adjacent cell based on whether or not two points or two antenna on the receiving cell would shift relative to each other, right? So if there was some relative motion within the cell, that it could then sense changes in its substrate. And so we approximated that as the length of a covalent bond, so basically an integrant attachment. And the separation, between, the separation distance between these two antenna points is about 10 nanometers, which we're approximating integrant clustering in a focal adhesion. And so what we determined using all of this information in addition to the elastic modulus of this particular gel is that the distance of significant transmission for this case um, and others is about 30 microns, and the distance between the cells at that time point is about 25 microns. So it indicates to us, at least on a, a back-of-the-envelope calculation, that this pseudopod is exerting enough force to create displacements under an adjacent cell that could actually be sensed and responded to by an adjacent cell. And so, um, so at least for this part of my talk, we believe that cell-generated traction forces can actually drive cells to come together. And so, again, this is just us marching up, trying to understand now how to use mechanics to control um, tissue self-assembly. And so, we started first by just looking at the same regions of uh, gels that we've been working with, and looking at how now cells interact when there are multiple cells on a given, given substrate. And the interesting thing about these pictures, which I'll describe in a second, is that the only thing that's really changing is that there's an increase in substrate stiffness. And so this, the substrate is getting stiffer and stiffer, um, but it's the same collagen that's, light, that's put down on these substrates. So we're not giving it any external growth factors or chemical cues. We're not mixing in matter gel. Um, this isn't 3D. It's just um, on 2D surfaces. And yet what we find is that as you uh, make surfaces more compliant, the cells are more likely to start self-assembling into network-like structures. As the substrate stiffens, they start to look like they do on polystyrene. So they tend to spread out, and there's no obvious directionality to how the cells attach to each other. At intermediate compliances, we see an increased cell-cell um, connectivity. So you can see that they're, they're touching more than you might expect on polystyrene, um, but not, in, not to the degree that we see the really soft surfaces. And so now we're going to probe this mechanism a little bit and see how it works. And so the first thought was, well, maybe the surface adhesivity is decreasing, and that's actually driving cells to connect. And so now we did the same experiment, and we um, changed the, the surface, the matrix mechanics, but now we also changed the amount of ligand down on the surface. So in these experiments, we took the amount of collagen from the previous exper experiment and went down one order of magnitude. And what we found is that on really soft surfaces, if you decrease the collagen content too much, the cells can't stick anymore. Uh, so the combination of soft plus uh, low, low ligand density equals cells don't stick. But as you move up, what we see is that the cells regain some of this connectivity where we wouldn't have seen it otherwise. So this is a 10,000 Pascal gel where if we had a lot of collagen down, they would be behaving like we see on polystyrene, but on a uh, uh, fairly, I'm sorry, that it's labeled here, this is 10,000, not 5,000. On a 10,000 Pascal gel where we normally see no um, substrate adhesive, or sorry, no network formation, we suddenly start to see cells um, perform, um, preferring cell-cell connections over cell-substrate connections. So if you modulate the chemistry versus the mechanics, you can start to induce um, some amount of cell assembly. And so I'll... Um, so what we, we actually did was to try and understand how these networks were forming, we did a lot of time mass microscopy to look at this actual behavior. So what's inducing these cells to, to actually self-assembly, self-assemble? And so what you can look at here, and it's a little bit hard to see, but if you take any cell that's sort of reaching out and you start to watch it, what happens is the cell starts reaching out, and eventually you'll see on this side, these cells will start to reach out too. And then eventually they'll connect up. And this is going to happen, I think, over here next. The cell is going to reach out, and then somebody over here is going to get a signal to do the same thing. And then they reach out over long distances, and they connect out. The one thing, too, you'll note in this video is that proliferation doesn't stop. So eventually, some balance gets struck where cells will just start to fill in. So this isn't, this is a very transient structure. It's not permanent. 
it doesn't last forever, but cells will start to assemble um, and, and eventually close in on the surface. But in the meantime, they form these odd structures where they're connecting over long distances. Um, and we're trying, uh, working very hard to understand the mechanisms that, that mediate that. So initial observation was homogeneous. Um, say this again? Initially, you placed cells in the machine. Yes. Yes. So, um, cells are actually surprisingly sensitive to light uh, before they're well adhered. So, it's very hard to capture this from time equals zero from the time they hit the plate. Um, but we, we, we this is about 24 hours, I think, after plating. And then we wash them um, from that point. Uh, what is the threshold, what is the maximum distance that you never see that the cell will be able to you know, make a connection? Okay, up the, they always make a connection even if they are far apart? Yeah. So that would be a, a hard measurement to make, but we can make the opposite measurement. So it's hard to say what the maximum is because it's a, that's a difficult experiment to run. But I can tell you what we've seen. Um, what the, it's hard to make a measurement of the threshold. Uh, experiments. I haven't, I haven't really thought about that. It would require some, probably some fabrication or patterning of the, the protein. But what we, what I can say <coughs> is that we've seen cells come into contact over hundreds of microns. So, what about chemical messaging between the cells? If, if they're more sensitive to contact and you don't have as much RGB on the plate, then that would maybe suggest that there's something not mechanical that's going on between them? Yeah. That's a good question. So I'm going to talk um, next about the other factors that we've seen that help stabilize these networks. Um, but as far as like um, like a chemotaxis cue, for instance, where one cell is releasing factors that the other cell is responding to, um, we found it hard to control for that because even really low, say, fluid shear stresses to wash media away affect the ability of cells to attach and they affect the migration of the cell even independently of chemical factors. Um, what we have done is we've switched out media. So we've taken media from cells on soft substrates and put it on stiff substrates and vice versa to see if there's something being released in general um, due to substrate compliance that's affecting the ability of cells to come together. And we haven't seen any differences in the cell behavior in those cases. Sorry, what, what about really thin membrane tethers between the cells? Oh, that's a good question, too. So there is this, uh, perhaps you've seen a paper, there's a paper, I'm getting older, so it's probably, <laughs> I stroll up the math like six or seven years ago now, um, with these, uh, I think they're called the TNTs, nanotubes that connect cells. Yeah. And they're actually very hard to see because you yeah. can, um, and to be honest with you, we, we can't really control for that. So um, the highest resolution microscopy we've done, we haven't seen anything that connects the cell. And then, Nothing with amino staining, but presumably, if they're that thin, any process like that is going to wash it away mm -hmm. anyway. Okay, so we're trying to understand what actually mediates this process um, uh, of this network formation, whether or not we can actually predict it based on how cells are adhering to the matrix. This is well known for a number of cell types, um, and this is the threshold for endothelial cells, the fact that if you increase the stiffness of the matrix, you increase how well spread the cells are. So on really stiff substrates, the cells are, are um, pretty much plateaued out um, at, their, at their maximum area. And on more compliant substrates, the cells are, are less spread. And so uh, what we actually found was that if you take the cells subconfluently, before they formed networks, or before they formed um, uh, confluent monolayers, and you look at the ratio of area to perimeter. So if you think about this, it's basically a measure of how round or how convoluted the cells are. You can then predict network assembly based on that. So let's walk through this a little bit. On the, uh, the empty bars, the white bars are um, 100 micrograms per mil of collagen, which is a relatively high density, and the black bars are two orders of magnitude less than that one microgram per mil. So again, this is the, the surface where we're seeing networks um, on very soft substrates, and this is the um, uh, uh, density where we're seeing networks on very stiff substrates. And so we looked at this now against Young's modulus. We can't measure um, the cell area on soft gels at this low density of, of collagen because the cells aren't sticking very well. But what we find actually is that this ratio of area per to perimeter 
is a predictor of whether or not the cells will form networks. Again, this is before cells have formed networks, this is just subconfluently. And what we find is that if you look at the um, uh, ratio of area to perimeter, when it's above a certain threshold, the cells will not form networks, and when it's below a certain threshold, they will form networks. And I have to say this line was um, uh, drawn uh, without any sort of statistical test, it was more of a, a, a qualitative, when we see a higher area to perimeter ratio, indicating that the cells are more well spread and a more rounded morphology, they don't form networks. And when they form a more spindle morphology, where the perimeter is higher relative to the area, they're more likely to form these networks. And you're talking about the area and perimeter of the network, of the cell collection, not just of one cell. Of a cell. Area to perimeter of a cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we started looking at how the traction forces change um, on these substrates where the cells become very polarized and spindly. And what we find is that the attractions are very much localized to these cell edges. So it says to us that the cells are able to, to, to target their traction forces and their contractility in a polarized way, pulling on the substrate basically from only two directions rather than from all various directions. <coughs> And this is, um, uh, this is some really interesting data that we're still sort of thinking about. So the convention is that force increases as the substrates get stiffer. And we've done these tests for endothelial cells now, and we found pretty reproducibly that as you increase the substrate stiffness, the force actually decreases. So the force is decreasing where cell networks tend to assemble, but the contractile force, and this is of single cells, is really high at the stiffness where we see networks assembling. And so this data, uh, we're still sort of toying around with a bit because it actually contradicts what people have seen for other cell types. Um, so we think that, that it's probably very specific to endothelial cells and this mechanism by which cells are driven to, to um, connect based on the stiffness of the substrate that the cells are sitting on. What's the strain in your matrix that you're measuring? And the forces you measure are the kilopascal. <coughs> Um, so the forces for these soft substrates are um, very, very high. So the strains are even um, hundreds of microns away from the cell edge. And are you worried about the, your force reconstruction in that? In that? So um, yes and no. So we've gone back through and been very careful about whether or not when we track our B displacements, whether or not they're very, whether or not, whether computationally, they match up with what we see experimentally. And so far, everything seems to, to mesh. We can't go softer than this, though. So the networks always, always form at 500 and 200 Pascal gels, but the displacements of those are, are impossible to track. So I, as I promised, I would talk a little bit about how, um, uh, how the chemistry of the environment affects the cells. And there was recent data, actually, in three dimensions that fiber actin is required to stabilize angiogenic structures, in, and again, in three-dimensional matrices in vivo, or I'm sorry, in vitro. And so what we did went, went back and said whether or not fiber actin was actually required for these 2 structures that we were now forming. And what we found was that, it's a little bit hard to see, uh, but this is, uh, the left panel is where networks are forming, and the right panel is where the cells are confluent, so soft substrates versus stiff substrates. And we stain here, this is for lighting DAPI, just so you can see where the, the network is. And then we stain for fibronectin, and what you can see is that when the networks form, the fibronectin co-localizes co right on top of these networks. So we obviously don't see it out where there are no cells, but more than that, it's, it tends to form fibrils to directly align with where the cells are. And this is in contrast to where you see these monolayers, it forms more of like a, a web-like structure rather than these um, uh, parallel fibrils um, on top of the cells. And so, since we saw fibronectin aligning with our structures, and this is fibronectin not that we added, so um, our substrate is not coated with fibronectin, it's coated with collagen, um, and we're not adding any exogenous fibronectin other than what's in the serum. We then asked the question whether or not fibronectin was actually required to stabilize these structures, right? So where's the balance between driving the cells together using mechanics and keeping them stabilized using fibronectin? And what we found is that um, that the cells don't actually require exogenous fibronectin to, to assemble in a network. Now, by exogenous, exogenous, I mean the fibronectin in the serum. So in this experiment, 
we took out the uh, fibronectin from serum, we redid the experiment, and we found again fibronectin still co localizes with the cells. So, because we're not adding fibronectin, we're taking all the fibronectin out of the cell, the conclusion is that this fibronectin must be fibronectin that's actually produced by the cells themselves. So, the cells are producing fibronectin and using it to stabilize these networks. But this still doesn't answer the question whether or not it's actually required to do the next experiment. We add an, in, <laughs> excuse me, an inhibitor that prevents fibronectin from being polymerized. So the fibronectin can still be produced by the cells. It can still adhere to the cells, but it can't be preliminized into this fibril, to these fibrils that align with these network structures. And we find something really interesting, which is that this is a time course over 17 hours. And what we see is that this is a compliance where we normally see network structures form. Over time, they tend to start aligning, like we would expect. And then over an additional time, they just disassemble. And the cells aren't dying, but they're not um, adhering, they're not forming networks. And we stain for fibronectin, as we'd expect, it's not forming these fibrillar structures. It's adhering to the cells, it's being produced, but it's not, um, it's not actually um, uh, being polymerized. And so our conclusion, at least, from these experiments is that, that mechanics can help drive the cells together, as we can see in this experiment. But then there, the maintenance of these stable cell-cell contacts into these network structures requires fibronectin um, to stabilize the structures and, and to keep the cells in contact. And so, um, in conclusion, uh, I hope to convince you that, that we can use compliance and, and mechanics to promote cell connectivity, and we can use it as a modulator of, of tissue formation, um, that the way cells actually adhere to this matrix, which we've measured as a ratio of area to perimeter, can actually predict the likelihood of 2D network formation. And so we think that's a measure of substrate adhesivity and how well cells can adhere, and then whether cells make the choice to adhere to each other versus adhere to the matrix. And that the chemistry is also important. So in our case, at least, the fibronectin polymerization is required to stabilize these network formations. So cells can communicate through the substrate. They can use these contractile forces to assemble into networks, and then they can use these network structures, and then they can stabilize these network structures using chemistry. And so really network formation is this balance between chemistry and mechanics that allow cells um, uh, to form tissue-like structures. So with that, I'll acknowledge my lab. Um, the latter part of this work was done by Joe Calfano, a third-year graduate student in my lab. With that, I'll take any questions. On the RGD surfaces, do you see any fibronectin being secreted and remodeled on the surface? That's a good question. So on the surface <coughs> alone, no. So we've done tests where we put down RGD, so it's an absence of cells. Put down RGD and then incubated with fibronectin or um, uh, serum, and then stain. And we haven't seen anything in here. But again, that's in the absence of cells. We haven't done those experiments with, with cells. And my other question is, I mean, your work and other people's work makes the coherence be like slaves to the, you know, whatever the integrants or the, the some ECM adhesions want to do. It's like, uh, you know, if they can adhere, then all of a sudden the coherence don't do anything useful. I mean, is, do you have any comment, like, or what, how well, would they regulate their own cell-cell interactions and they have, you know, without having to modulate cell ECM adhesions? That's a good question. So we, um, I didn't mean to ignore coherence. I love coherence as much oh, as I love integrants. What they are in these cells. <laughs> what are the cell cell So V coherent is the, the okay. big one. And uh, we looked at um, V coherent expression based on substrate compliance. Mm -hmm. So just as subconfluent cells, does the, is there something about the integrins that change the coherent expression? Yeah. And we don't see any changes. If we then start to look at cells as they assemble, we can see the coherent expression start to go up um, as they form cell cell contacts. But even mechanically, they just seem weaker. Like they're not, they're not able to maintain that contact in the presence of a strong ECM I, region. I think that's, I think that is what we're seeing. I think that um, that they're weaker bonds than integrin bonds. And uh, I won't be able to cite numbers, but I think uh, Cheng Zhu, for instance, has done a lot of experiments on that, looking at um, coherent strength and integrin strength, and that it's it's accepted that the coherence are weaker bonds. But given the correct compliance, I think coherence play a really critical role in transferring those forces. So when we look at traction maps of cells coming together, the forces look like they get transferred from cell-cell mm -hmm. connect or cell matrix connections to cell-cell connections. Mm -hmm. 
and those cell-cell connections can stabilize forces over the body or the cell. So I think they're important, um, and uh, and we're we're working at getting it at what kind of forces they exert and how important they are in these stabilizations. Suppose you put a, a suspension of cells with low, low density, yeah? so cells are far away from, from each other, uh, on, on a soft substrate. So you said that uh, after some time a network will be formed. Uh, also, uh, you said that cells almost do not migrate on those soft, soft substrates. <laughs> so uh, how cells become close to each other? So there, so there is a caveat that there is a threshold level of plating density that you have to have for networks to form. So if you don't plate enough cells, um, nothing happens. Uh, the cells stay apparent. You don't see networks. Uh, eventually, assuming there's assuming there's enough adhesive ligand down and the cells can proliferate, then the cells will start to proliferate so they get to that threshold density, and then they'll start to form networks. Um, on the other hand, what we typically do is we found the amount of cells we need to plate to get network support, so we don't have to, to wait for them to proliferate up to that point. One more question. Um, you said that the stiffness... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> stiffness is... Uh, between, you looked at between 1,000 and 10,000 uh, pascals. How does that compare with the stiffness of, for example, the extracellular matrix in our bodies or that's, that's a good question. So that's um, uh, obviously dependent on the type of extracellular matrix you're, we're talking about. The 1,000 pascal regime is the region of interest for tissue formation in general. 1,000 and sub-1,000. Sub uh, 10,000 for endothelial cells. Um, in this context, is too high um, to be physiological. Now, if, if you now go up to large arteries and you're talking about the extracellular matrix under the large arteries, that starts to approach the, I think, 5,000 to 8,000 range. Um, but as far as um, uh, microvascular tissue compliance, um, 200 to 1,000 is, is about the physiological range we're interested in. Any more questions? Um, you talked about how one cell can sort of sense the other by pulling on them. And you talked about sort of a strain, like a displacement. But do you have any comments on if that other cell is sensing that strain or like a stress? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, we thought a lot about it, and um, uh, Rumi might be able to answer this better than I can. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure. We assumed in our calculation a strain because we were thinking about integrins again and we are thinking about relative translocations and movements in the actin, um, but just as easily could be stressed. But to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure how to get at that answer. Uh, I see there's still quite a few questions. Perhaps in order to stay on schedule, you should preserve them for the discussion later, if that's okay. Um, before we go to the coffee break, uh, Christina Maketi has some announcements. Thanks again, folks. Colleague, we have an important thing to do. I promised prizes for uh, sound bites and posters. So, first of all, these prizes are actually cash prizes that are possible thanks to the generosity of CASE, which is the Center for Advanced, Advanced Systems and Engineering at Syracuse University. And we have today here David DiMaggio, who handles the uh, co op and uh, internship program and will help me uh, here are the prizes. I realize uh, it's possible some of the people get their prizes might have left, but I hope uh, at least uh, some of them are still here. So, they might tell you a few words about case before. Uh, Good morning. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for coming to Syracuse. Uh, I, I guess you're here from around the world, right? All I know is the weather got better since you got here. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a terrible Sunday, and I know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's been beautiful. It's actually been well, today also. So thanks for coming to Syracuse, and, and actually this event is one of the first major events in this building, which has only been open for about nine months. And my office is right out here, so you go out and get your coffee and you stare into that aquarium-looking fishbowl that says case. Um, that's where I can't hide. Um, I, I run a co-op program, and basically my responsibility is to connect employers across New York State with students at Syracuse University. Um, we've had about 250 students working since we started the program just three years ago, 
and we offer very unique service in that many of our grad students here, if you're not aware, um, are foreign nationals, and we have facilitated uh, the ability to pay those students through the university so they can uh, all get out in the workplace uh, without necessarily having to do their critical practical training and work much earlier in their, in their college graduate degrees. So welcome and thank you. Uh, CASE is the Center for Advanced Systems and Engineering, uh, which is sponsored uh, by a grant from New York State. Um, which mainly around uh, data fusion and predictive analysis, areas which I am not familiar with. I'm more of a commercial person that tries to connect people with employers. So uh, thank you for coming again, and uh, we did provide some support here today. So I got drafted to uh, give out a couple of awards. I think the first one is going to go to the first poster session, um, which goes to uh, Henry Fu from Brown University. Is Henry still here? Henry's, uh, <laughs> the title of Henry's poster was Theory of Swimming Filaments in Viscoelastic Fluids. Did I say that right? Congratulations. Thank you. Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> And the, for the second poster session, uh, goes to Volker Schaller from um, Technical University in Munich. And <laughs> the title of Volker's uh, poster was Self-Organized Patterns in 2D Active Fluids. I was going to say second because I saw it uh, the second. <laughs> <it's cheap laughs> <inside>. Volker, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and I'll uh, give out the posters for the sound bites. Well, actually, the uh, judging committee had a bit of a harder time coming up with one winner. There were three talks uh, that the three judges unanimously found they were truly outstanding. And so we actually uh, decided to uh, give out one first prize and two honorable mentions, which means the first prize gets a little less than the poster prizes, but I think this is just fair. So um, the honorable mentions go to Shafan Luo from Syracuse University, from uh, working in the biomedical, biomedical engineering department. For, oh, and I was going to say, the, I forgot, I'm not as well prepared as, uh, as David was, <laughs> I have to say. So the title of his talk was You Can Get Blood from a Plastic and New Self-Healing Polymer System. Forgot to read. Thank you. Uh, the second honorable mention uh, goes to Valerie Cross from Cornell. I believe Valerie is probably not here. Oh, she is. Great. Okay, come down, Valerie. And her talk was Mechanism of Cell-Cell Communication Within 3D Collagen Matrices During Vascular Network Formation in Vitro. And the first prize goes to Kelly Burke, also from Syracuse University and Case um, Western, Case uh, Reserve University, and also working in uh, uh, biomedical engineering. And the title of her talk was uh, Liquid Crystalline Elastomers as Soft Shape Memory Networks. And with that, they're all free to go get some coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs>